Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us this week before the holidays. Um, if you're live here or if you watch this recorded, uh, wherever you're at, you might be watching after the holidays, but we're recording this just right before Christmas and the new year. And I'm super excited for my guest today. Um, I will let you in a moment tell um, his story of how he got into doing what he's doing. But I know it'll be relevant to so many of you listening because many of you have had your own experience with mold or with <clears throat> mold related illness or with your homes. And we're going to dive into to all kinds of questions that you might have for an expert remediator today with Michael. Um, I just want to say uh, for housekeeping's sake, if you uh, want to find all my free content, you can go to jillcarnahan.com. We have like 10 years of blogs. They're all free. And I just love writing this stuff. So a lot of people have found me because they were searching for mold related information about illness and it's all free. So please go to the website. Um, I also have a free mold guide. This is like a 20, maybe 30 page document that tells you what to do if you've been exposed to mold. And I I wrote this specifically for the listeners that are out there that maybe don't have access to a doctor like me or a remediator like Michael, who are just desperate to find help and they need some sort of a guidance. Um, so that's out there for free as well. And all you have to do, it's probably easiest if you just Google Dr. Jill Free Mold Guide, you'll get to that landing page and then you can uh, download that for free. And like I said, just lots of great information for you. Um, I don't always mention this, but because this is a mold related podcast, I worked with a company called Quicksilver to create a mold detox box as well. And you can go and look at more information on molddetoxbox.com. Um, that's just a great product. Once again, I found so many people who couldn't see a great doc or a great remediator and were stuck and we're like, what do we do? How do we start? And so if you go to molddetoxbox.com, you can find information about that kit. Um, I always joke, this is a terrible analogy, but it's like the happy meal for mold detox, <laughs> which of course I hope you're not eating happy meals, but it's like all in one. And it says 30 day because it has everything you need to start a 30 day detox. And I say start because if you're listening or you have mold related illness, you know, 30 days won't do it. I typically tell patients we're just getting started in the first four to six months. And again, Michael and I will talk a lot about if you have exposure, what to do, please put in your questions. I'll be watching for those as well as we're talking, but molddetoxbox.com, you can get more information. And then finally, um, my regular retail store is just Jill, um, Dr. Jill Health, drjillhealth.com. If you need any products or things that are um, professionally uh, you know, screened, they're all there. So enough about me. I am so happy to introduce my guest, um, Michael Rubino. Um, we met, it was really interesting. He's been doing this a while and just has a great story and a great view. And if you're out there and have dealt with mold, um, you know how hard it is to find a remediator who really gets mold related illness. They're like one in a million. And Michael's one of those one in a million. It was actually one of his employees who had gone through mold related illness herself. And um, she reached out to me and said, hey, you need to know my boss and here's his book. And by the way, he mentions you in the book. <laughs> so it was really special to get that and to see what you'd written and just such a concise guide. We will be sure and let all of you listening know where you can get information about Michael, about his book, about his um, remediation company and all of that during our podcast. So listen here, but let me introduce him and then I will um, turn it over to him. So Michael Rubino has helped over 1000 families heal from toxic mold exposure. So far numbers keep growing and this is just the beginning. He's dedicated to helping you uh, have the resources you need to overcome poor air quality and create a safe home environment. Just a little note on air quality. You've all heard me say so important, clean air, clean water, clean food. And this is the core of healing. Clean. clean air is 80% of our toxic exposures. And many of you um, listening know that. And those of you who don't might be surprised at how big of a percent. That's why I talk so much about this because the air quality really, really matters to your health. Michael's become renowned uh, leader in the mold and remediation space. Um, if you don't follow him on Instagram, um, is your Instagram the mold medic? Is that right, Michael? It, it is, yeah, at the Mold Medic. That's, That's correct. Great, great place for great information. I love what you post there. Um, he's president of All American mm -hmm. Restoration and author of The Mold Medic. He continues to push the conversation forward for creating better indoor air quality. He's been featured in dozens of podcasts and news channels as a leading expert in all aspects of mold remediation and air quality. And he's also consul certified mold remediator by IICRC and ACAC, both organizations where I recommend you look for qualified professionals and a contributing member, sponsor, and speaker at the Indoor Air Quality Association. So long intro, Michael, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you. You know, you certainly made me sound cool, which I really appreciate, but I want to highlight the fact that when I first got into this, uh, you mentioned that, that I did mention you in my book. 
um, you know, you were someone that I stumbled upon and really started to identify and understand, you know, mold toxicity as it affects the person. And, and that really kind of cements the fact of why I'm even here in the first place, because how I got into this industry is um, I'm a second generation contractor, mm. meaning my father was, was a contractor before me. Um, and he did fire restoration. And if you know anything about fires, they get put out with a lot of water. So there was mold was definitely a part of it, but nowhere near the way that I look at mold today. Mm. And um, it was kind of that journey of, of really dealing with that after Hurricane Sandy and starting to see people get sick where I decided to go down this rabbit hole. And, I, you know, of course I'm thankful and I know the people that I help are thankful that I went down that rabbit hole and you definitely came up and, and a lot of the research that I've done is, is because of you and, and the work you've done. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. You've helped pave the way for me to exist in the first place. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. That means so much. Like I said, I was really honored. And uh, it's so funny because I'm just right here writing my blog, seeing my patients in clinic and trying to make a little dent. In, and so whenever I hear someone like you or a patient that's impacted, it's always really precious because you never know who's listening or watching or like for you, who's reading your book. And it means a lot because sometimes it's when you're in that silent wall of virtual interaction, you don't really day to day see all of the impact yeah. that's being made. And it means a lot that someone like you's out there, um, because for me in the clinical practice, I can help heal the patients. But what I know to be true is if they have ongoing exposure, there's almost nothing I can do that will really shift their illness. And so I, I really rely on people like you, because I always say, you know, you have to start with a clean environment. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if you're in a really um, significantly toxic environment, no amount of supplements will fix it. Right. So what you do is like yeah. the first step. Um, you told a little bit about your father, but tell us a little bit more about how did you get into this? And even that depth of understanding that you are, you have around the person who gets ill related to mold, because that's a whole different ball game than many remediators. Yeah. So my, I've been around construction pretty much my entire life. You know, my dad was a master electrician, went on to become a, a restoration contractor, specifically geared more towards fire because it, historically that's where a lot of the, the restoration work, um, just existed mm -hmm. in the space. I started to learn underneath his tenureship, uh, just kind of really understanding the construction industry, which led to building bus and how homes are built and designed. Um, I started to see a lot of the flaws in the way we build our homes, yeah. but really it was after Hurricane Sandy when I, I lived in the Northeast at the time, and there was so many homes that were just decimated from you know the, the hurricane itself, all of this water damage. And what was really peculiar to me was seeing people who were sick, especially after their homes were supposedly already remediated. Yeah. And so that was really what kind of started to uh, make me question everything. You know, what is remediation? What mm -hmm. is it about remediation that really helps the person? And I, kind of what I saw was that, that really remediation uh, traditionally is more of a cosmetic handling, right? It's kind of this looks like it never happened, yes. not actually scientifically like it never happened as, as some of these slogans might end up being. But that's when I started to realize the disconnect between what actually makes someone, you know, exposed uh, to contaminants in their home and born out of these water damage events versus, you know, what the industry is actually doing to handle this. And just to give like a, a very quick example, yeah. uh, we look at, I look at mold as two different things, both the living organism and then the particle that gets created by the living organism. And so a lot of these IICR CS520, I mean, it, it, they do a stellar job at kind of addressing mold. I just feel that the educational piece regarding that it, it tends to, to leave off the byproduct side. And yeah. so, you know, you're removing this wall and, you, you know, you're removing the mold that's growing into the drywall, but you're not addressing the mold behind it growing into the studs, potentially mm -hmm. the insulation. Um, there's a lot of confusion in that arena. And then certainly we, we know that mold that's growing in one corner of a room is going to transmit through the air to other parts of the home. Yeah. And most remediation protocols or policies we're not actually geared to address that side of things. As a matter of fact, it was really just neglected uh, yeah. overall. So when I started to look at all these things and I started to dive more into microbiology and, and some of the health components of this, I said, well, it, it's, it's clear as day. We're just missing really the boat altogether in the remediation industry. 
Um, I ended up linking with uh, some really amazing people on the mold inspection side that were doing some more progressive uh, types mm -hmm. tests um, that helped identify, you know, more of the cross contamination yeah. issue. We're talking 2013. I had no idea what a mycotoxin was at the yes. time. Um, here I am. I'm, I'm tasked with, uh, you know, removing mycotoxins from someone's home. I, that's another rabbit hole. I had to, to dive down and figure out well, what is a mycotoxin and how does it react in our environment? So in that research, I found out that it acts more like a chemical residue. So I started diving down this path of what, how do we clean up chemical residues? Wow. And there, in, there was born out of this process that, that is in the book that kind of talks about how do we deal with the contamination at hand created by the sources of mold born out of these water damage events. So that is the, the long and short of, wow. of kind of how I stumbled upon this. And it's, it's obviously evolved from there. Oh gosh, I love that you're talking about this. Now, just in my clinician, I am not the remediation expert view. I want to kind of restate that. And then let's dive into some of the details because you'll be able to clarify more than even I can. So from my understanding, we've always thought about spores, which are actually very large. They're like, I don't know, 10 part uh, particulate matter, right? Versus 2.5 in the VOC range is those lower. So we have like 10 and five and then 2.5. The 10s are like the dust and the dirt and the debris and the mold spores are quite large. They're actually easy to filter in general, like with a scrubber system or whatever. And when I always tell patients, and again, you can clarify anything that I have not quite right, sure. but you could have, especially some really nasty molds that like dark, dank places and they're stuck behind either floorboards or in the wall, stachybotrys, catomium. These guys are dark and they need a water source and they often are not in the air. Air. In fact, in my experience, if you have stacky in the air or catomium, you've got a really big issue, right? Like they don't yeah. typically throw their spores into the air easily unless you have an open place where there's a mold source. Often they're hidden. But what yeah. you said is while they're hidden behind the, under the floor, behind the drywall in your crawl space, they're secreting mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are more on the realm of the 2.5 particulate matter and they're invisible. They're like almost like fumes. I think of them like smoke and formaldehyde. They're not particulate in the sense they're like E. coli, I think is about 2.5, which is a bacteria. So these really tiny little things. Now those actually cause the organ damage, the immune compromise, the toxicity, they are being studied by chem, you know, in the, uh, in the armed forces for chemical warfare, some of the things like trichosethene. So these are the really nasty chemicals that mold was created to protect itself. So it secretes these chemicals and they cause damage. But most remediators, unlike you, are not looking at that. So they might do air sampling, which I think is a perfectly wonderful, valid part of an inspection, but they're not testing for mycotoxins and they're not testing for, I, I still like QPCR. And again, I want your comments on these because I think this yep. big picture, what I often see is I see in the QPCR, some of these nasty things in the dust or in the EMA test or some of the tests for mycotoxins, I see much more toxic things than I do in the air samples. And I want all three, but so what's your comment on that whole slew about like, where do we find these? How do we really get a good inspection? And why do patients, here's the number one question. Why do patients often have one, two, three, four inspectors that do an air sample and they say everything's perfect? You know, I, it's a great question. Um, and then there's a lot of great questions in there. First off, I love qPCR technology because I mean, we all we all have heard about PCR technology at this point with this uh, pandemic we're living in. Um, it, it, it actually is looking at the DNA of what's there. Um, so that's spores, fragments, the whole nine. It's all of the things that could enter the body opportunistically by getting into their breathing zone. Um, our homes are living breathing systems, right? And so what's in our dust ends up becoming inside of our body. So it's really important we analyze the dust, not just the air. Um, the air gives you a snapshot in time. In, in, one, in one particular area, right? So they'll have these pumps that get set up. They typically set them up in the center of the room. Um, they run it for, you know, five minutes. And it just tells you within those five minutes what exactly had passed through that specific area. Um, it's very limited because you can be three feet away and have a, a problem and it's not going to pick it up nearly as much as if you were just three feet closer. Mm -hmm. So you really want to look for more signs of water damage and test closer to those areas. Mm -hmm. So you can really get a, a better view. Um, I think air testing is very, very limited. And unfortunately, it gets misused a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of part of the problem. Because yes, if you do an air sample in the center of the room, and there happens to be nothing going on in the center of the room, it can give you this false insecurity that your house is fine. And I can't tell you how many times 
you know, people send me results and they're like, you know, what do you think? What's the remediation plan? The guy recommended no remediation. Right. I said, well, you know, it, we only have three air samples to go off of. Why did he take the air samples in those exact locations? And it was just, oh, it was just random. You just did a random check. You know, yeah. that's not really, those are not really quality assessments that are going to provide yeah. you any data. It would be kind of like going to your doctor and be like, I don't feel well. Cool. I'm going to check your vitamin D level. Vitamin D looks great. You're fine. It's yeah. like, what about all the other things that you could check for? So mm-hmm. that's why I say, you know, there's today, there's technology, we call them tools in the tool belt. You have all these different tools in the tool belt. We want to utilize those things. And that's actinomycetes, it's mycotoxins, it's, you know, ERMI or QPCR, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, EMA, of course, there, there's different variations of it. Um, you have air testing, of course, but you want to test specifically based upon what you're seeing visually. And then of course you have swabs. So swabs mm-hmm. are pretty good. If you have, let's say a water stain yeah. and you're, you, you're like, well, I'm not sure if that's mold or if that's just water damage, well, then you should definitely check for, test for it. Right. And I think that's a good indicator. Um, for anybody who's followed, you know, someone like Brian Carr or at mold finders on Instagram, for example, you you'll, you'll see some really cool posts of him swabbing something that looks pretty innocent, yeah. but by the numbers, you're like, holy crap, there's a lot yeah. there. Yeah. And I think it's really important to kind of, to, to really utilize these tools in the tool belt to really help, you know, diagnose what's going on inside the home that could be causing or exacerbating chronic illness. Yeah. Gosh, you just did a great overview. And the one thing that you mentioned, but I want to emphasize is there's no substitution for a great inspector because you need this computer, just like I use it with my patients. There's no you know, but like you could read an article online, but for me or someone who else who's a medical detective to go in there, same as what you do, Brian, is um, basically um, all of the important stuff really comes from that inspection and looking at it. So I want to emphasize if you're out there and you don't have a good inspector, um, you really do need to um, get someone in there. But sometimes in the interim to get started, you can do some of these things to get started on your own. I bet you have people, Michael, that comment that bring you testing and they ask you then where to go from there. What, let's talk to the people who are like, oh, I think there might be an issue. I've been feeling poorly in my house. What would you say? Um, How would you advise them to start? And uh, give us just kind of a rundown of, uh, say you have suspect illness from mold in a home. What would you tell the client? You know, probably my first recommendation, like if you're you're not kind of sold on the whole idea of getting someone inside your home, um, you know, really doing a full gamut of testing, I would say the the first place to start would probably be qPCR technology. I would analyze your dust. It's going to give you again an overview of what's in your dust, what's in which means what's in your environment. Um, it just will it will give you the confidence that you need uh, yeah. or or the lack thereof um, of to move forward or not move forward on is there a problem inside my home? I think it's it's one of the most elementary tests that you can do to identify if there's an issue um, and you know, again, just bringing back Brian up into the conversation, developing this uh, technology called like the ERMI code, where you can then decipher that uh, at a very uh, respected cost, I think is, is probably a good way to go to identify really what's going on and do I need to take steps further from there. Mm. I love that you say that because as a clinician, again, I am not the expert. I always tell patients, but I've had to learn enough to help people get to people like you. And so my take on, in, say I'm in a clinic, I'm doing questions on mold symptoms. And if they're positive, then I do a visual contrast test, either online or in my clinic. So a few screenings that are free, and then I'll go deeper with labs that cost more money, urinary mycotoxins, blood work, et cetera, and, and look at a deep dive. But say I'm at the point where I'm highly suspicious of mold, I will absolutely have them order an ERMI. Now, if you're listening, you're like, like ERMI, QPCR, what's the deal? I'm going to explain, and then I'd love, Michael, your thoughts on it, um, because I bet we'll be the same. ERMI was an old, um, it's not really old, but the way they set it up, they tested some HUD housing, and some of it was supposedly moldy, some of it was not, and they took a logarithmic scale to say, these are the moldy homes, these are the non-moldy homes, and get a score. Most of us agree that that score is basically invalid. It doesn't mean a whole lot. So when we say I've I've turned to start calling it qPCR because all that means is that it's um, PCR testing, DNA testing of the dust in your home, and it has no attachment to that ERMI, which a lot of remediators are like, that's not valid. So it's the same test, though. If you order it, it's still called an ERMI, but the, the yeah. thing that, um, Michael, you and I do, and this is where, again, I'm not the expert, but I do have patients often start with that because I've learned to look at those numbers 
and I and I do a Hertz me score, and then I also look if there's anything out of line, right? So I look at the individual molds that are on that sheet. And again, I'm not the expert, but I can usually see patterns. And then I'll say, you need to call Michael or someone like that. <laughs> but I do find like you that for me in the clinic, it's the easiest way to give the patient some control over starting. And I would say 90% of the time, what I like to do is actually match what I see in their dust to what I see in their urine. And if I see high trichosethenes and then high stacky or gatomi, I'm like, bingo, this is coming from your environment. And then I can clinically say, this is relevant. Go get an inspector because I don't know where it's at. I just know there's something bad in your home and your dust. Um, and then I also want to mention no affiliation, but if you're looking to do tests and you can mention other companies, I think right now in Virobiotics and Mycometrics are two good companies. What do you have to say about qPCR? Do you feel like that's in line with what your thoughts are? Yeah, it's actually exactly in line. I mean, you know, the scoring methodology that the mm -hmm. ERMI has is very flawed. Um, it, yeah, you'll, you'll have scores that are like an eight where the data is like, right. I mean, you almost can't get it better. And then you have scores that are like a negative four and it's like, you know, yeah. stackies off the charts. Yeah. And you're like, this is not a safe house, right? So, right. you know, you can't, you can't really rely on the score, unfortunately, but the data itself based mm -hmm. upon the qPCR technology is really valid, right? Because that's actual, that, yeah. that all is reliable, that you can actually count on um, the algorithms and things like that. If they're ever going to, you know, focus on updating that in the future or whatnot, you know, it, it definitely isn't workable now, but um, the technology is very, very useful. And you mentioned this word screenings earlier, yeah. you know, and kind of how you use that in your practice. I would say that qPCR technologies is, is kind of exactly like that. It's, it's your, it's your home screening, right? Mm -hmm. And that'll tell you based upon that, what you need to do, you know, from there? Is it get a deeper dive inspection yes. or does this place look relatively good? Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on if you're obviously a renter or a homeowner that can kind of determine your path to, you know, securing a lease mm -hmm. or, you know, going down that path of remediation before you move in, if you're on the homeowner side. Yeah. Oh, great, great analogy. So then here's another question. And again, um, I've had this happen a lot. I'm sure you have too, but for those people listening, what if you get in, you find out there's mold in your crawl space and maybe behind your wall, you get a remediator in, they go in there, they, they cut out all the mold plus, uh, you know, margins and they do a good job. Then you repeat either the ERMI QPCR or some sort of air sampling and it's worse. Now you and I know there's more steps than just that. Why don't you talk yeah. about like why is there failed remediations and what the why the dust and dirt and debris and the clean of your home matters? So go through that with us a little bit. Yeah. So first, I think the term failed remediation is probably a really good one to bring up and talk about and kind of unpack because I hear that word a lot and I think it it really stems from two different things. One, either you didn't get enough testing data, you know, to really identify what, what was going on inside the home so that the remediation could have been performed. And so sometimes like a failed remediation can indicate that additional testing, um, additional issues are needing to be found, located and remediated properly. And then on the other side of the fence, you may have all the data you need but the actual remediator doesn't understand what to do with that data. And so the work plan isn't really going to be conclusive enough to take that data and make sure that you're going to get the outcome you're looking for. And so that's kind of the other side of the fence of failed remediation. I see both, you know, a, a lot, uh, unfortunately, and um, it, it is pretty frustrating no matter which side of the fence you're on. But I think it's really important to kind of do your due diligence, especially if you're vetting a remediation company like All American Restoration, as an example, you want to make sure that you're, you know, th that you feel comfortable that they're actually going to achieve the outcome you're looking for. Um, I think contractually, I, I see a lot of stuff that happens where, you know, um, they say one thing, but the contract reads something totally different. And so when you're trying to hold them accountable on passing, they're like, well, I, you know, I don't guarantee that. I think always make sure the guarantee in writing matches up with their, what they're talking about verbally and just get clarity on what, what's included. Because, you know, a lot of this stuff is unfortunately just traditional remediation tactics. They're, they're opening walls. They're taking care of the sources, yes. but they're not dealing with what that source has created over time. The mycotoxins, the mold spores, and it was sporulating. So if they're not specifically going to clean your home after to re remove or reduce those things, um, when you do another ERMI after the fact, it could even get worse yes. because they're shifting stuff around. There's all this equipment moving air around. 
yeah. even if they're putting a room under negative pressure. I actually did like this whole animated Ermi video that you guys should check out to kind of see the, wow. the animation behind what I'm talking about. But essentially imagine uh, doing a bathroom on the second floor, you put that bathroom under negative pressure. There may be hidden sources of mold across the home that mm -hmm. are behind, hit, you know, behind walls, you can't see them. But when you put that bathroom under negative pressure, all the air in the house is moving towards that bathroom. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, you're going to be pulling stuff into the environment it, it, inadvertently. So then when you swipe the environment to test it, you're like, oh my God, it went up. What a failed yeah. remediation, you know? So it's, it's it, unfortunately, a lot of remediators don't know or understand what I've just mentioned. So you're going to have that disconnect and being able to explain comfortably what happened and makes sense to you. But when you're actually removing the sources and then you start to clean, you'll actually start to gain, you know, net, net uh, positive results, yeah. meaning the scores get lower and lower, the counts get lower and lower, everything gets better. So it's, it's really the way I look at remediation is you're looking to kind of tackle those things and create what I call a new equilibrium, a, a lessened toxic load. And that's kind of the goal of remediation in general, or at least it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I love this. So let's talk real quickly, kind of like, I'm going to talk about what I think might be kind of a steps. And then you clarify, cause you're the expert here, not me. Sure. Basically though, we need to find the source. We need to have mm -hmm. an expert go in under negative pressure. And like I said, cut out anything for us. You don't want to treat stuff that's for us. You cut it out. Um, there are a few surfaces. Would it be like concrete or um, non-porous material that you could treat or even studs in a wall? Yes. So you just scrub them um, yes. and you, you just really scrub them and then treat them, right? If you can't remove them. Is that yeah. correct so far? That's okay. correct. And then after that, this dust and debris, it, before the remediation, it was going around your house and your air ducts and things. And then after you might've actually stirred it up. And what you said is real true because often that contained source, especially the spores are kind of, they're left undisturbed and they're secreting toxins. So the um, person there may not feel well, but they're actually fairly undisturbed. When you go to remediate, you're really blowing it up, right? Like no matter how good it's contained. So the thing that I found to be key after, and again, I want your comment on this is the air ducts need to be cleaned at some point after, and the yes. house needs to be cleaned in detail with a small particulate clean. There's pretty good protocols now because basically that dust and debris that's left behind that could be like parts of mold or toxin residue from mold that can cause illness as much or more as the original source. Right. So talk a little bit about that. Did I have that right? In what order? Of you had you had that you had that exactly right. And I think that's kind of where I think most people miss the boat is you know they're they're looking at the source remediation as remediation because honestly traditionally that's what most mold remediators have been pushing um, for sales, if you will. Um, the whole cleaning process at the end after the sources are eradicated is really important. And in that video I mentioned earlier, I talk about how it doesn't matter if you're remediating one room or 10, you have to clean the house after because you're going to inadvertently pull stuff into the environment. You know, you had, when, when those sources existed and most, most of the time when I visit somebody's home, there could be sources for 10 plus years that have been in existence that were hidden that people didn't know about, could be even be previous owners you know, that, that had this uh, problem occurring and they didn't, weren't aware of it. So, you know, think about the lifespan of that and how air circulates throughout a house, especially with our forced AC that we all have. Typically um, it just kind of moves around the home. It gets into, you know, these dust trappings, it gets caught in interstitial areas like below the baseboards. Um, so, you know, once you are re in remediation, you're going to be putting that room under negative pressure because you don't want to what you're opening up to cross contaminate into the rest of the house. But because your house is already essentially cross contaminated, you're gonna be pulling that towards where you're remediating. And so I think a lot of people miss that fact or, or, or maybe just haven't really connected the dots on it. But when you look at it that way and you start to really wrap your head around it, you see how important it is to clean thereafter. Cause as you're pulling stuff to the center of the environment, you wanna then remove it, all the, all the particulate from the environment, including the toxins, um, and, you know, of course, there's also potential for bacteria, depending on the path the water came from. Um, so all of that has to be taken into account, tested for both before and after um, to really validate that it was done. And I don't care how good of a remediator you are, that you're dealing with microscopic particles, you have to test after the fact to say, okay, I can confidently say that this person is better off now that this place is fixed. 
Uh, great, great overview. So a couple of things. First of all, um, what do you think is the biggest cause? We've touched on these, but a failed remediation, like when you go in and often I'm assuming you go after they've maybe had a previous a remediation that's unsuccessful and you see the things that didn't work. And again, we've touched on all this, but what would you say like top three things that failed remediation might be caused from? Um, uh, so, I mean, just, I can give different examples for yeah, each. For, I'll give one example of a remediation project that was, uh, that I know of that happened in New York. Um, and it was, I mean, when you went in there, there was still debris, uh, drywall debris. I mean, chunks of drywall, um, left behind, which, you know, if you, you, if you get, get debris on that level, you know, that they're not HEPA vacuuming on a molecular right. level. Right. So, um, you know, you start seeing that things were missed, you know, visibly, you can tell kind of microbiologically it's not clean. Yeah. Um, and there, there leads to that neglect. Um, I've seen, you know, situations where the remediation looked really good. Um, you can tell that the company did a great job. However, you know, there was, other sources that, and we don't have all have x-ray vision, but there are other sources that needed to be identified, um, eradicated, and then the fine particle cleaning would then achieve that new equilibrium. So it's, it's kind of this, um, uh, years of experience that I've cultivated that have kind of really allowed me to, to stay away from failed remediation, not to say that it doesn't happen where I get, you know, stuck in a project and have to, you know, go through these procedures to figure out what the root cause is, but it's kind of like knowing when things should work and they're not. So it allows me to pivot and say, okay, there has to be another hidden source somewhere to get the inspector back in there to identify it. So that's, that's how you can avoid kind of scenario two. Um, scenario three, I mean, unfortunately it, it's, it's tough. You have to really vet the company to really understand if they know what they're doing, because scenario three, you have people that come in and they're telling you, you know, I can fog the place. You don't need to do all this remediation. You don't need to do all this tear out that's over the top. And it's just, it's just really misguided advice that leads you down this road where things just do not meet the outcome you're looking for. And so, you know, it's, it, I think it's just vetting people, if, if you have a good report from an inspector and there's all this clinical data and you have ermies and you have mycotoxins, if the company's telling you, you don't need to worry about that kind of stuff, you know, that's not necessary. That would be a red flag for me um, to identify that that company might not be what I'm looking for because there is a, a really big difference between companies that know how to do this medically and companies that know how to do this cosmetically. And I think you have to really understand and vet the difference. Mm. I love that last line there because that's really where it's at here is, uh, again, it's kind of like me with my little special focus in functional medicine versus a uh, general practitioner. They're amazing for having a heart attack or you need a basic blood work. That's what yeah. they do and they do a great job. But if you want this very specific, narrow, deep focus in chronic illness, mold, Lyme, et cetera, that's what I do. And same as you and the remediators. Um, and I love the, honestly, from me, my perspective with the patients, it's, are they getting well? So I always, if we're doing the plan that should detox them and at six months, they're not making any progress. I always have to go back to, are they living in a clean environment? We have to go back to then they need someone like you to help me because sadly it's more common. If I had to guess percentages, I'd say almost 80% of the first time remediations are failed in my patients, maybe more, right. which is crazy. That, um, is, that is, yeah, that's depressing, honestly. It is. It's so sad. So it is important. And you know what? The other thing it usually costs more. It really does. Cause it takes more time to do what you do than to go in and go out and not clean. The clean itself can take days, right. Depending on the size of the house. So oh, yeah. Yeah. And the manpower and all we, that. Yeah. I, I estimate it's to do it right. It's about 500 square feet per day that, yeah. that, that a, a yeah. team can comfortably clean. So, you know, yeah, 5,000 exactly. square foot home, for an example, that's 10 days. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, if, if somebody's telling you they can do it in a day or two, I don't, yeah, I think I don't think they're going to change rags often. Let's say that, you know, yeah. I think they're going to go through it pretty quick. And, you know, this really takes a standard of care, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's it's got to You got to take your time with it. And it's just a downtime alone with, you know, mm -hmm. verifying things with post testing and waiting for those results and making sure that everything comes out good before you move on to reconstruction, mm -hmm. you know, doing it right. It, it's going to take it's going to take longer. It's ready, aim, fire. But the result you get at the end of the tunnel is so worth it, right? Because you can definitely feel the difference when you're looking at a standard cosmetic remediation versus a deep medical grade remediation. 
Mm, I love that. And the other clarifying thing is there's a lot of people who are not super sensitive and they might do okay with a standard remediation. So we're sure. talking to the person who's very much ill from mold and their uh, maybe mast cell activation, they're hypersensitive to their environment. They're the 25% that has more genetics related to poor detox of mold. And again, the average person might not be as affected, but the people that I see, all of them are much deeper affected and they really need a very clean environment. Yeah. One thing you mentioned that I've had personal experience with wanted to talk about fogging has its place. But fogging by itself in a severely, you know, home that has severe issues is I had a personal experience where I had a small water leak under my sink. I found a little aspergillus in the air, like, oh, let's get this cleaned up. And this was years ago before I really understood someone promised me, oh, we'll just fog and that'll be fine. And what happened is I was having no symptoms before the fog. And then they fogged and I got really sick. I didn't feel well. And in my mind, I'm assuming whatever enzymatic process they used in the air broke up those spores and things that were in the air, made them smaller fragments and actually caused right. more um, in my body in effect. And I realized, oh gosh, we have to be really careful because you must always take care of the source. Um, I have found in some cases when someone has no choice for a couple months that fogging can sometimes diminish the air, the amount in the air just temporarily. But if there's a source... Um, any thoughts on fogging its place? Because I feel like it does have a place in the cleaning and, and remediation at times, but where would you put that in the order of operations and what cautions would you have? Yeah, I would put that more at the end when mm -hmm. you removed yes. all the sources and you're, yes. you're doing that deep cleaning. I think it's valuable there because it's going to help bind to the particulate in the mm -hmm. air, um, forcing it to the surfaces, allowing you to vacuum and wipe them away. Um, where it's misused is when it's used in place of remediation, yes. I think that's really the big thing. I mean, there's um, there's white papers out there that that uh, the fogging companies release, and if you actually look at the white papers, it'll show you the, this U-shaped kind of curve um, where the levels do go down, right? And, and mainly, we're talking about through air testing. I, I don't think yeah. it would quite make the mark on PCR testing, but uh, the air test does go down, sure, you know. And I I I do think that it provides people some relief in the very short term, yeah. um, but it comes back with a vengeance, and and I'm sure that it 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 probably speeds up the production of mycotoxins because. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if mold feels threatened and, you know, we don't know all the, the ways mold feels threatened, um, but certainly I don't think this is helpful to the equation on that particular um, piece of the puzzle. But uh, essentially, you know, that's really the simplicity of it. It's going to come back. It's going to come back with a vengeance. So you have to ask yourself, is that money better spent in actually fixing the problem once and for all? Or, you know, do you want to go down this road of fogging every couple months um, and, and, you know, kind of that being your plan? You know, most people, I would say, um, when they buy into the fogging, it's because they're actually being sold on the fact that this is remediation. Yes. And, um, you know, for so many people, and this is why it's, it's so difficult for me to even call myself a remediator, because when you look at the, the term remediation and all of the people utilizing it and what, how, are, how are they utilizing that, you, you start to think that it's all the same. Yeah. And so if you think a $2,500 fogging is the same as, I don't know, a $25,000 remediation, yeah, you're going to be skewed in the way you're thinking because you're going to say, well, why would I spend 10 times more if I can get the same result? The problem is that you're not getting the same result. Right not even close. Right. And, you know, and I think that's where I wish, you know, there, there was more care in the way companies marketed themselves. Yeah. That's it. I feel like your industry is coming around. I think to people like you, but it's kind of like the wild west mm -hmm. as far as it's starting to get more regulated, but it's anyone could kind of call themselves a remediator and who knows how good of work they're doing. So that's super important. Um, like right now I do have an oil-based fogger and I use it in my home and office maybe once a year. It's purely preventative. I don't have any known issues, but I would never do that if I had a source. And that's what you're saying. You have to kind of go to that source. Um, I do find it just keeps, and we have all these wonderful um, filtration systems. I always say my air in my office is cleaner than like a hospital <laughs> because we have five air filters, all with VOC filters, and they're always running in every room. And so, and same as my house. So it's kind of neat to see just a little, this yes. is just a side note, but we got through COVID the whole Whole entire pandemic, the 18 months, um, because I was a you know um, uh, medical office with retail, we were able to stay open with all my five employees the entire time, and nobody got sick. And I awesome. think part of that is the air quality. Like we really had good air quality and air exchange, and um, 
our filters would filter out viruses. So even that quality. Um, any thoughts on air filtration or UV lights or what what uh, what are your thoughts about say post remediation? What would you recommend people do if they want the best air quality in their home? Oh yeah, I mean first off, we filter our water. You know, we should be yeah. filtering our air. Uh, I think that it's important. It just helps again, keep the, the toxic burden um, that we're exposed to as minimal as possible. Um, I think air quality and the, and the efficiency matter. Um, if you're asking me what's the number one feature that I look for in, in, in an air quality device, uh, such as an air purification system, I look for how small of a particle can it remove. The smaller the particle can remove, the, the better value it offers. Yeah. Um, there was another interesting thing that I noticed about air purification systems. There's a ton of like YouTube videos you can kind of check out like different efficiencies, mm -hmm. but it's another wild, wild west uh, industry. But you have some air purifiers that say they go down to, I don't know, three microns, for example. Mm -hmm. right. And you have another product side by side that goes down to three microns. And if you put particle counters in front of both, they both say 99% effective you get one that has more particles coming out of it than the other. I, I find that very strange, right? Because 99%, you would think, right. you know, it's, it's going to be reducing the amount of particles, but some of them just happen to be more efficient than others. Um, and again, it's, it's back to these marketing tactics. A lot of these companies are, you know, just get away with as long as it's 99% efficient, 1% right. of the time, they're, they're going to go for that. Right. Yeah. Um, that makes things confusing. So I would definitely do my homework on them. Um, you know, a lot of the, the companies that are well marketed, um, they're, they're, while they're, they're, most of their money is spent in marketing. So you got to wonder how good the quality is. They always verify that. Um, take a look, read the reviews, look at the videos, see if somebody has put a particle counter in front of it, because you'll be surprised that uh, YouTube is a, is a wondrous place for that. Um, and I think, you know, dive into how small of a particle can actually remove, because if it can't remove that small of a particle, um, keeping in mind that mold can be anywhere between two and four microns, mycotoxins smaller than that. Of course, you have the fragmentation that happens as well when the spore itself breaks up into smaller particles. So you want to keep all that in mind, the smaller the particle, the better. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I use Austin Air. There's many other good ones, but just personally from feeling better perspective, it, it tends to work. They've been around a while. One other thing I want to mention, there are some of these newer companies that promise either UV filtration or ozone. And some of them mm -hmm. even say we don't produce ozone. But what happens in those types of machines is the interaction of their process with the uh, particulate in the environment can create ozone. And there's just a caution. Some people feel fine and do great with that. But patients who have lung inflammation or lung issues like myself five years ago, I did very poorly. I felt burning in my lungs. I felt much worse when I had that type of filtration system. So for those who have lung inflammation, even the smallest bit of ozone in the air can be irritating. So I would just caution, again, they can be good. I don't wanna say they're all bad, but for patients who have inflammation, my experience is they don't do well with the lung inflammation. So caution. Um, <laughs> that, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I particularly don't use ozone technology in, in my business just because of the fact that yes, um, there's a lot of those issues. There's also some issues with just the, sometimes it breaks down certain things mm -hmm. that people yeah. have inside their home contents wise that um, can, can cause some problems. So I tend to stay away from it for that, from that reason. Good. Yeah, I think it's again, you and I are dealing with a sensitive population and they don't do very well with ozone. Right. Now, the average, maybe the hospital system's great, whatever, but it's yeah, a very different yeah. ball game. So, totally. um, good. Gosh, so much great information. You mentioned a video a couple of times. So, when we're done, you be sure and send me that link to it and I'll make sure I'm, I will. Uh, I will. Wherever you're watching this, there'll be a link to the video that Michael was referring to and, of course, all your websites. But before we go into where people can find you, what if someone is, um, first of all, do you do consults all over the U.S. and can people call you for virtual? How do you work? I do. So I do. I do do consults. Uh, I do virtual, uh, you know, uh, very sparingly do I hop on a plane and, and come uh, in person. But that that does happen from time to time. Um, I we are a nationwide company as far as all American restoration. Uh, I am the founder of that company. I still am the acting president. Uh, you know, definitely involved behind the scenes and making sure that our, our, you know, our clients are well taken care of. Um, and we do travel, you know, nationally, essentially, um, consulting wise, I consult internationally as well. Uh, a lot of clients uh, in Ireland and the UK that don't really have a lot of uh, 
professionals out there with, with a vast amount of expertise, um, even less so than, than in the U.S., unfortunately. So I've been, you know, doing everything that I can to help as many people as possible. Um, there's only one of me, so I get, you know, booked up and stuff like that, but I try to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and I do definitely respond a lot on Instagram, where I give a lot of free content, and apparently TikTok now, too, because you know, awesome. I got to keep up with the times. I know, right? <laughs> I've been, I need to get down there too, but it's <laughs> so a journey. That's awesome. And what's your main website, Michael? My main website is themoldmedic.com uh, okay. for, you know, to contact me, learn more about the book and, and how to work with me and just unbiased questions that you may have in regards to how do I find a good inspector or how do I find a good remediator? For the remediation side, we have a ton of free information on what remediation should be. Um, and you can find all that stuff on allamericanrestoration.com. Awesome. Um, and of course, we'll uh, link to those. And I highly recommend your book. So again, that's how I found you as your, one of your employees sent me a copy. And I was like, this guy really knows what he's doing. I want to connect with him. And we all need each other. And so I definitely need to know more totally. people like you. And so I highly recommend. And you were kind enough to send me a little stack. And I've been giving them to patients because it's such a great little concise um, it's almost like a handbook and you probably wrote it for that purpose is giving people. Yeah, just a simple guide, you know, and I, and I tried to really cement the fact that it's, it's not all equal. Um, yeah. I look at this as a triangle. You have, you know, you need a good inspection, you need a good remediator and you need a good healthcare practitioner, right? Because without that, you know, it, it's really hard to make sure you have everything you need to heal. Yeah. Totally agree. Well, thank you for the great work that you are doing in the world. I'm so glad we connected. So glad I could have you here. Any uh, last minute advice or uh, notes or anything else about what you guys do? You know, nothing that's immediately coming to mind. I know we covered a lot of great topics here today. You know, if, if for anything that I've missed, if you have questions, please reach out. I'm happy to answer. Awesome. And if you're listening, uh, just look below wherever you find this. I will be sure and include links and information. Thank you guys for joining us so much today. And thank you, Michael, for your great work in the world. Thank you for having me.